Welcome to the Better Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. It's Friday, March 29th. 2.30 2.30 Pacific Time. We are here in uh, the Network Studios in Culver City, California. I am your host, John Wood Jr., uh, and I'm being joined here today by Randy Leos, our Southern California coordinator for Better Angels, uh, Greg Steinbrecher, social media manager for Better Angels, and the man to whom all hate mail should be directed. <laughs> Please, no. And joining us for the first time, uh, our editor of written content at Better Angels, Mr. Luke Phillips. Uh he who is not with us today, our good friend, Mr. Kieran O'Connor, uh, Chief Marketing Officer for Better Angels. Uh, my buddy and colleague, Kieran, is somewhere out traipsing South America, uh, partying in Colombia, I think, gentlemen. So, lucky him. Lucky him. Now, he's at a, he's at a wedding on a yacht or something like oh, that. that so. Poor guy. Oh, that, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to call him after yeah, this. Yeah, that's sign of the 1%. <laughs> <laughs> that Just po- as I was getting uh, comfortable with the pronunciation of his name, too. I was going to use it like <laughs> 10 <laughs> times today. <laughs> there you go. Greg was practicing your yeah. name, Kieran. Uh, sadly, you're not here to see the fruits of it. Uh, so we'll have to muddle through without him, but that's okay. I think that we got to – I think that the squad here is well, uh, you know, well equipped to tackle the issues of the day. And so we begin. Uh, thank you, folks, for joining us again at the Better Angels podcast. And there are some things uh, uh, going on in the country that I think we ought to talk about and bring an inspiring spin on uh, spin to uh, if we can if we can uh, if we can manage it. Uh, now, a lot of things going on, but top of mind, I think, for many folks uh, is the subject of the Mueller report. Uh, the Mueller investigation has been concluded. Um, the special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into uh, into the influence of the Russian government on the 2016 presidential election, and into the possibility that there may have been collusion with the between the Trump administration and the Russian uh, the Russian government or the Russians generally. Uh, we'll get into the nuances a little bit here. We have not seen the Mueller report. I haven't seen it. Randy, Luke, Greg, they haven't seen it, and you folks haven't. Seen seen it either. Um, the only person who has uh, given a representation of the contents of that report is the Attorney General, uh, A.G. Bob Barr. And in his summary of the report, he has stated that uh, the report finds uh, no evidence to demonstrate um, – that's not the exact quote – but to the effect of that there's no evidence to demonstrate there having been uh, e- either uh, – uh, explicit or tacit coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russian government uh, to uh, help enable President Trump's election. And so President Trump has declared uh, victory and exoneration. Uh, he has ex- he's declared himself exonerated from any wrongdoing. And uh, I think that uh, what looks like many Republicans are now calling for investigations into uh, sketchy Democratic activities. We might talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there are still uh, folks uh, folks on the left, however. Many folks on the left are making the point that we haven't seen everything that's in the report. It's possible that there was no tacit or explicit uh, uh, relationship between the Trump campaign and the Russian government, but that there nevertheless was still could have been wrongdoing. And perhaps there's a stronger case for obstruction of justice that could be made even though A.G. Barr has declined to pursue obstruction of justice on the basis of there not being perhaps a sufficient argument to be made for that uh, drawing from the information in the Mueller report. So, again, that's a long-winded summary from myself. Randy, Greg, you guys have probably chewed on this a little more than I have. Let's get Randy in here because I'm sure he's chopping at the bit. To tell hey, John, can I, uh, can I make a quick correction real quick? So uh, so you said A.G. Bob Barr. Uh, oh, did Bob I say Barr? Bob Barr? Yeah. Yeah. And I made Bob the Barr. same mistake recently, actually. Oh, okay. okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> For our listeners, Bob Barr was a U.S. congressman involved in the prosecution of another president of the United States, Bill Clinton, back in the nineties. <laughs> uh, the right. current sitting U.S. Attorney General is A.G. William Barr. Yes, yes. Barr. you just put the two names together, Bill Clinton and Bob Barr, <laughs> then you get Bill Barr. <laughs> the, the sad thing so is, convenient. The sad thing is, this is probably not the last time I'm going to make this. <laughs> I'm sure we all will. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, but, but the great thing about Mr. Phillips here, you know, if you don't have Google but you still have Luke, you're, you're, you're still in good shape. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, 
you. That's one of the reasons I love having Luke as an editor. It's uh, it's that's been right. rewarding. <laughs> so, uh, okay. well, you're Randy, tell us. So, what so well, one of the good uh, the pieces of good news, at least from my perspective, and hopefully lots of people's perspective, is that uh, the Attorney General's office just announced that they will be releasing the full text of the report uh, next month. Um, of course, it's going to be redacted. Uh, I actually do have faith that the uh, AG's office is going to do a reasonable job of, of redaction and, and um, you know, leave in the relevant facts. Mm, um, I okay. understand there's going to be plenty of sensitive stuff that they will have to black out. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged that they are going to be releasing this report. Um, I was I, I was kind of wondering uh, what uh, Reds, what Republicans felt about um, the release of the report. Did, were Republicans united in uh, either way in, in believing that the report should be released or should not be released? What, what, what do you guys say about that? Well, I, I, uh, Greg, do you want to jump on that really quick? Yeah, I mean, from what I can tell, it largely depends on what your sort of flavor of republicanism, conservatism is, since you know, we we tend to conflate the terms now along with like Trump populists and and like classical liberals, and it, it it's hard to say. That from what I've seen, and the people I tend to follow and respect have also wanted the report um, uh, to be made public. I am sure there are some hyper Trump partisans who do not want it public, or or. But I, I I don't know. I don't tend to follow those opinions quite as closely. Well, I well, also now, th- now correct me if I'm wrong, guys. But yeah. didn't uh, President Trump himself say that he wanted the, I, the report to I be released? I think so. I think he. I think the Congress has. Uh, I think asked for the report to be made public, and I think Trump has at least not stood in the way. He may have even explicitly called for it to be made public. What I have seen is also people asking for the documents that uh, incepted, uh, caused the inception of this investigation to also be released. So whether mm-hmm. that's those are the FISA uh, applications or uh, the Steele dossier, the memos uh, written by Rosenstein, uh, I think people also, because there's also now a lot of noise about this being sort of there, there being a um, poisonous apple at the beginning of this, mm. the steel dossier that, right. that unleashed its tentacles everywhere and that that this investigation started for corrupt reasons. And I think it's important that that also gets uh, the light of day so that we can put that behind us, too, if that, in fact, has some bite to it. So that's where this conversation is going. I mean, the national conversation here around the subject. And, uh, yeah, I think I can add to that. But, Luke, uh, do you have anything to jump in on here? Yeah, so um, I've uh, I've only followed this issue tangentially, um, to be perfectly honest, and I never thought I'd be saying this, but I think this is one of those issues that, for me at least, is less interesting than our uh, usual fantasy football presidential politics, right? So, uh, so, <laughs> Luke, like, how, can, more, how could you not be interested, Luke? This is this this is a, a question of justice. This is a question of getting to the truth, Luke. Uh, this is a question of of understanding how it is that, that 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 a menacing foreign government has been able to impact our election. How dare you be uh, dismissive of this, Mister Phillips, in all of your your uh, erudite intellectual sophistication, my friend. What you, what, you think sophisticated public intellectuals are concerned with truth? <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah, that's a touche um, moment I mean, right there. So, okay, so, so, so a couple things right off the bat. I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I've always told people I, uh, like, I, of all the three branches of government, the judiciary and the things the judiciary does are usually the least interesting to me, just at, at a personal level. So I haven't, like, been absorbing all the different kind of reporting on the reports coming out. Um, I have followed a little bit of, uh, of what conservative world commentary is writing about it. And a lot of the commentary obviously is like what Greg said. Um, there's also some sides of the pro Trump intellectual world that, um, aren't opposed to the report coming out at all, but they are kind of adapt adopting a, um, kind of mocking stance of the general, um, like tenor of d- discussion over it over the last couple of years, like, oh, you want to see what Trump is hiding? Well, here it is. It's just like a little bit of tomfoolery and not much other than that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so which, you know, I mean, the more I think about the the vast majority of reporting here, uh, it, it all looks to me un- until we see what the actual report has in it. Uh, it looks to me like most of the reporting is kind of speculative based on what 
the preset opinions about President Trump are on the on, in the vast majority of conservative and centrist takes, and to some degree liberal takes. And I think obviously it's important that uh, once the report does come out, it's made available to the public. But I mean, I, I just am entirely agnostic about this because I don't have the legal expertise to really be able to comment on what has happened thus far. Yeah, well, it doesn't stop what, anybody what, else. Yeah, I was going to say, not having the legal expertise to comment doesn't yeah. prevent. Well, I, th- I think, think that we all knew that this was going to be an anticlimactic kind of event. Did we? <laughs> Did we? I, 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 feel like I, a think, lot, I feel like, a, I mean, I had that sense, but I feel like a lot of folks were very much disappointed at the fact that, you know, uh, Robert Mueller didn't essentially just drop the guillotine on uh, Trump's Come on, neck politically. Treason, treason, so, treason, so treason. Ah, oh, it's not treason. Oh. <laughs> yeah, didn't Rachel I Maddow mean, she, like tear up during her show? I, I I did hear that. I didn't I didn't see that. I haven't watched. The I, I, I read I read an article by Rich Lowry in the National Review where he sort of basically was making the point that. And, and by the way, I'm I'm a fan of Rachel Maddow's actually just in terms of her being a show host and and I think a reasonable person who seems like a very nice human being. But Lowry was making the point that Rachel Maddow had basically built her whole show off of hyping up anticipation for the justice that would be served as a consequence of you know Robert Mueller's investigation into the Trump administration and that, you know, uh, I don't, I can't remember if he said this about her or this. I think this is something that's true for CNN and maybe for Maddow's program in particular. After the Mueller report, uh, Maddow's on MSNBC, of course, but after the Mueller re- report was reported on by William Barr, uh, ratings for CNN, I guess, have dropped uh, dramatically. And I imagine that's probably true for Rachel Maddow's program and other other left other you know left leaning programs that have made commenting on this and building up anticipation about it a big part of their programming. Uh, so you know we're we're kind of we're kind of you know joking about it here a little bit just because you know you got to laugh to keep from crying sometimes but all this stuff really is serious because as an American people we've wrapped our emotions up into this you know from both sides of the aisle into what's going on here you know yeah uh 12% down i'm hearing uh in terms of the ratings for CNN um well you know part of the point that i was making is that you know we I think we did know that we were not getting the report ourselves, uh, at least in the in the initial release, and that's that's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of anti climacticism. Mm. Uh, you know, is that we, a word? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, it, it is now. We're so, <laughs> so, but uh, you know, I really think that uh, it's going to take. Uh, we should have known that it was going to take a while to for all of this stuff to come out eventually, and it, and it's going to be um, the job of reporters to eventually, when the report is actually released, to comb through it over time. And, <laughs> and well, yeah, look, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot so of there's going to be a so lot of strident the beginning of this. Yeah, okay. there's going to be a lot of strident reporting, you know, from from the top. But but reporters are going to be you know taking the leads that the report uh, you know seeds, and they're going to be taking those and. Re- and investigating them further, um, and and I think we'll we'll have a lot more information about what the real right. truth is over time. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't think I, I don't think that any uh, I certainly didn't believe that we were going to get any real sense of um, you know what exactly the the true extent of of what's gone on through this initial release. Mm, right. Yeah. Now I listened to a press conference with uh, Lindsey Graham uh, and Lindsey. Now Lindsey. Uh, uh, Senator Graham, a uh, Republican senator, obviously, and Lindsey Graham had reminded the the uh, people in the press pool that he supported the Mueller investigation from the beginning, even though he did not necessarily uh, believe that Trump had colluded with Russia, but he thought that it was a question that was that it was worth having a special counsel look into to put the minds of the American people at ease. And Graham is now, he says, you know, convinced on the basis of what Bob, uh, what William Barr, (laughs) Attorney General (laughs) William Barr, uh, stated in his uh, four page assessment of the report that uh, the Trump administration has indeed been vindicated uh, of, of the, uh, you know, of the charge of collusion. But then Graham pivoted from that to in the direction that, that Greg was starting to talk about a moment ago into saying that now that we have appropriately looked into this issue of you know the Russian government's impact on the election and specifically uh, the possibility that the Trump uh, campaign may have 
colluded with uh, Russia to that end. Now it is time for us to possibly employ a new special counsel in looking at the various ways in which Democratic operatives may have misused the intelligence or surveillance uh, systems and the and the justice uh, system in order to potentially subvert a political opponent in uh, then-candidate Donald Trump and how they also may have um, used uh, uh, may have uh, misused or abused power um, by themselves colluding with the Russian government in order to bring a, bring about information that could be detrimental to President Trump. And so it, it, it's all for anybody who's just now tuning in. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine there's any such people uh, listening. But then again, I have a difficult time following all the twists and turns of this. So what Graham is talking about specifically, a few things he's talking about is the possibility that uh, a FISA warrant uh, to surveil the uh, – to, to surveil, uh, I guess, individuals associated with the Trump campaign uh, was obtained on – based off of information – gathered from the Steele dossier, Christopher Steele being an MI6 agent, British, essentially British. Yeah, former. Former, former. former British intelligence agent. Apparently, Christopher Steele was paid by a group that many of you have probably heard of called Fusion GPS, which I think is an opposition research team, right? Mm -hmm. But Steele got- Hired by the Clinton campaign. Hired by, well, I think hired by a uh, law initially, firm that was employed yeah, by I the think Clinton the Cl campaign, yeah. right? So I think the sequence of events here is is that you have the Clinton campaign that retains a law firm that employs an opposition research team called Fusion GPS that then employs former British MI6 uh, agent uh, Christopher Steele who compiles a dossier based in part on information that I guess he got from the Russians somehow or that there is some link between him and the Russian government where he gets some of the information that, that – He claims, I think, to have sources in the Russian government to right. make it sound more legit. I think it's a question – I still think it's an open question of how – uh, how good his methods were. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it, it, you uh, know. so so, but but just to just to round this point off, so you can see how you know there's it's indirect, but you, you can see how Lindsey Graham is sort of making the case that the Clinton campaign may indirectly have in, uh, colluded with the with the Russians. There's questions of whether or not Attorney General Loretta Lynch had to recuse herself from the uh, Hillary Clinton uh, email investigation. Uh, not just because she had that infamous meeting with Bill Clinton on the tarmac, but maybe because of other ways in which she had facilitated abuses of power. So, you know, it's well, the FISA warrant, the Steele dossier. My, my, my whole thing is just that, you know, now the stage is being set for a brand new series of investigations aimed at the Democratic side of the aisle by, you know, Republican members of Congress and, uh, I guess potentially backed by the Trump administration. And, uh, I just don't know how this country is able to stand up under the unending series of retributive investigations that are cascading out of all of this. Uh, but anyway, Greg, you were saying. Oh, I was just going to make the point that, I, that one of the issues that, that people have uh, a problem with is the fact that it came out in Lisa Page's testimony before Congress that the FBI – was at least considering charging Hillary Clinton with, I believe, gross negligence, um, which is a step above. The, I, it, there's different scales to it. I didn't. I don't quite understand everything, but that it, that she testified that the Department of Justice kind of leaned on them uh, not to charge Hillary Clinton with. Gross and, and who is Lisa Page again? Oh boy, Lisa Page worked. Oh, I forget. She she worked for the F. I think she was an FBI lawyer. Okay, but I get all these people tangled in my head. <laughs> um, but anyway, she. Yeah. So, but I, I, it came out recently. I think in the few days before the Mueller report came out, that she testified before Congress that the Department of Justice, which was then headed obviously by the Obama administration at the time, kind of uh, told the FBI or suggested to the FBI that they were that they didn't find uh, gross negligence constitutionally <laughs> viable mm. um, to charge Hillary Clinton with, um, while others have have pointed out that actually it was very viable so mm -hmm. there there I, I, who knows but i think think the 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 issue is that there it looks at least like there might have been some kind of uh underhandedness when um the obama administration was in charge regarding the investigations into clinton and trump
So okay. I, I, I'd like to respond to a lot of this stuff go, because go, go ahead, Randy. Uh, you know, it really is Set a, a rehash of the stuff that, that we were hearing about two years ago uh, mm-hmm. when the entire investigation began. Um, and, mm-hmm. and it was all pretty much litigated back then. Uh, the fact that, you know, this investigation did not start from the Steele dossier. It did not start from those FISA uh, applications. Um, those were pretexts that were, uh, you know, I think uh, Devin Nunes, you know, put together, was it him or was it, uh, uh, well, what's the what's the other uh, rep's name, who, who basically put together a letter uh, mm. that said, oh, there's this big scandal on the Democratic side uh, because they were using this as a, uh, as a just- justification for this investigation. Mm. And it turns out that, that it was completely not. And the, and the FBI said, no, isn't this it, was- Isn't it the case that part of the- Part of the way they were able to obtain the vice, the, the FISA uh, warrant, though, was on the was on the strength of the uh, Steele dossier. No, wasn't they, that a part they, of it? They they cited the Steele dossier as basically a something that had to be uh, disclosed as mm. as part of uh, as something that had come up in their investigation, but it, it in no way was a justification for actually getting that uh, that FISA application approved. Mm-hmm. So this that that is an issue that has been litigated in public and it has been debunked thoroughly. Uh, and and that was that was something that the Republicans really tried to make a big deal of. Quick qualifier, Randy Leo's is coming from the blue <laughs> Absolutely. coming from the blue perspective. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so yes. Continue Randy. And, and, continue. and, and I remember from my very blue <laughs> perspective. Wrong. Uh, means wrong. Uh, knowing <laughs> <laughs> for sure that, that this had this had been thoroughly debunked. Mm-hmm. So so, um, and when you say that you know there has been have been calls for the Democrats Democrats now to be investigated, like I've heard that of course from Trump because mm-hmm. that's just his you know that, that he he has continually called uh, for a an investigation of the quote unquote deep state right. Uh, right that he believes that that is aligned against him, uh, but I think that entire premise. Has mm. been thoroughly debunked. Mm. Um, you know, it goes back thoroughly to, debunked by who? By by the entire uh, media, left and right. Uh, so, including the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Uh, so, so the fact is, when we go back to you know these these claims about uh, whether Hillary Clinton should have been prosecuted, uh, James Comey, who was certainly no friend of the Democrats, and when he brought it up eleven days before the election, uh, really threw a wrench into the system, was the one who said, "Yeah, Hillary Clinton did something stupid, but it was not prosecutable." Did he say that it wasn't prosecutable, or did he say that he wasn't recommending prosecution? Because you know, there's there's a difference in that in that language, obviously. I um, you know, I, I think that so. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here because. Uh, as smart as you guys are, I really don't think that we're going to unravel the, the mysteries of the legal universe surrounding these things in this conversation. And as long as you're zooming out, John, I have some zoom out thoughts as well, too, once you uh, get ready for that. So, okay, good deal. We will go to yeah. your zoom out thoughts as well here. But the reason I think it's good for us to get into the weeds about it a little bit is to just kind of make the point that, you know, uh, for folks listening, this stuff is richly complicated. And the reason why it's worth pausing uh, to note that really quickly is because from my vantage point, from all of our vantage points, I think here as folks, uh, you know, leaders with better angels and people who are interested in restoring social trust between Americans across the party divide, uh, it, I think it's important to kind of be humble before the fact that we are all of us sort of watching the progression of very complicated narratives that pick up on all sorts of facts and data points that are triggering reactions from people across the spectrum to events that most of us are not really in a position to have any insider knowledge of or any sort of thorough growing understanding of. And yet I see the country as being sucked into sort of a social sort of – you know, sort of a social civil war in some sense on the basis of our just being so certain that Hillary Clinton is thoroughly corrupt and represents the corruption of all of, 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 of all the Democrats or Donald Trump is thoroughly corrupt and represents the corruption of all the Republicans. And so, you know, uh, obviously I'm simplifying, but I think that, you know, I, I, I get to I, I get to wanting to answer this question, you know, how is it that we manage to navigate this conversation as an American people that allows us to, one, you know, support the side of this argument that we uh, in our convictions want to support, be it, you know, the red side or the blue side, so to speak, liberal, Democrat or Republican side. But two, you know, how do we manage to pursue that conversation in a way that preserves the integrity of our civil civil discourse and civil society? So, Luke, you had a thought. 
Yeah, so uh, let me start off with a nice short quotation for you guys. Um, Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. Mm. Uh, That was one of the quotes halfway through George Washington's farewell address delivered uh, to the American people in 1797, I believe. Oh, I thought that Um, was Adam Schiff. (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, you know, well, but but it's interesting. It's interesting because because um, this quote here uh, was made uh, in the context of a broader speech about partisanship and what the Washington administration thought was factionalism being driven by right. Thomas right. Jefferson and the so-called Jeffersonian Republicans um, mm-hmm. against the national interest, right? And uh, the people who wrote this particular speech, Alexander Hamilton mainly, were kind of casting a partisan blow in the direction of the Jeffersonians saying, oh, the Jeffersonians like France more than they like America. Mm, Uh, True patriotism should not be that. And I'm I'm sure George Washington wasn't that petty about it. But um, regardless of how it was written, the way most people have interpreted this over the last two centuries is um, be careful about foreign influence infecting an already Uh, polarized American democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And so over the course of the Mueller investigation and the media show that's been kind of circling around it in different and reactive ways on both sides, um, one of the things that I was really grateful that about is that uh, uh, Bob Mueller was selected to do the investigation because Bob Mueller obviously is a Republican and has uh, kind of a pretty nonpartisan kind of old Cold War uh, style of um, public service, you know, the kind of thing that you see when you see John Huntsman working for both Barack Obama and Donald Trump and the kind of thing mm-hmm. that you see when Robert Gates yeah. working for both George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Kind of uh, thing. The kind although, of thing although many Republican critics would criticize the team of investigators he had working underneath them, some of whom they would accuse of being uh, Democratic operatives. And so, of on. course, part brief, of the resistance. But, but, <laughs> brief aside, but, but continue. But, Luke. but yeah, but the, and I'll wrap up as soon as I can. The broader point is that like there's a tradition of nonpartisanship that I think everybody who's partisan, which is all of us, like to tap into when it serves our partisan interests and mm. somewhat distance ourselves from in other time frames. Right. That's just what we do that we're, we're human beings we're americans and that's kind of what we do um and in the national security community those there's, there's a lot of people these days who are studying information warfare right um which uh back in the bad old days of the cold war they called political warfare and they sometimes called it propaganda and that's like the sowing of misinformation by uh either your government or foreign governments to influence what the domestic populations of various countries are thinking, right? It didn't work very well against totalitarian regimes that can control the flow of information. Mm. But in elected governments, and we saw this a lot with Soviet influence operations in Eastern and Western Europe, and to a smaller degree, Soviet influence operations inside the United States, it's easy to sow kind of confusion over broad social issues. But Mm. one of the things with the rise of interconnected internet stuff Um, and just mass communications in the modern age, and especially a relatively unrestricted press with very, very radically broad freedom of speech stuff in America, is that uh, it's possible for a lot of people to peddle a lot of narratives, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, normally the way that analysis is used nowadays is by uh, some liberals uh, to suggest that there is a kind of like Russian influence operation to do um, to dupe American conservatives, which I think is kind of partly true. But I think something that that leaves out is that I don't really think the, I mean, I mean, if I were just like not saying I'm a mole from the Kremlin and like, I'm actually a robot who's just algorithmically programmed to say this stuff to sow confusion. We, we have suspicions but, both ways, Luke. But yeah. Well, yes. Uh, but um, it seems to me that if I were like a Russian intelligence guy, um, trying to figure out how do I make the United States more polarized after Trump's election to kind of sow confusion there and give uh, give the uh, Russian government more freedom of operations, I would turn Americans against each other. Mm -hmm. I would not I I wouldn't have the resources to like go do a full on kind of thing, but I probably would try and drop a little hint here that could suggest something, even if it doesn't lead to anywhere and something here that is definitely bad against the law will get somebody in jail, even if it doesn't compromise the president fully per se, I would drop a lot of those 
um, on both sides, which uh, evidence seems to suggest that the Russians were providing both campaigns. I mean, uh, not, not both campaigns, but people around like the kind of spectrum with this kind of stuff, you know, spread mm. hearsay and make Americans start to make Americans paranoid again, you know? Well, and uh, yeah. so, so the, the broader point is like with a lot of the stuff with the Mueller investigation here and the broader Trump Russia gate thing is, I don't think we can really fully separate um, that kind of uh, the, the fact that a lot of the stuff going on is very polarizing. And the people who, uh, who we, who are the, the ultimate bad guys, the Russians, are probably okay with it being as polarizing as it was just for various information warfare kinds of reasons. Yep. Well, well, if the, well, if American political polarization is the objective of the Russian government, I would say the Russians are winning. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> oh, they succeeded, think, ad, not admirably, but they succeeded. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> beyond their wildest dreams. I, I think yeah. that I think we've we've read that um, they were surprised, they were shocked at how successful they were yeah. um, in 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 sowing a lot of different narratives that that really targeted a lot of different kinds of people. Um, and and I think Luke, you're absolutely right that 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 it, you know it really gets down to the main issue that we are letting a you know an outside influence kind of drive a wedge between us and and that is one of the most dangerous things for our republic and of course of course on the other hand the fires of american uh, uh, division were were you know burning well before the russians launched this particular right. Uh, endeavor, and so they're throwing gasolines on gasoline on fires that were already lit. For instance, exactly. I don't think we can blame the Russians for the Jesse Smollett controversy. <laughs> uh, that's uh, also all all in the news uh, right now. Did you like that segue? Really? I did. I did. I really appreciated it. I mean, I'm a little sad I can't debate Randy more because I do I, like I do <laughs> think so that much. there there are, are, are uh, uh, shades of gray to what he said about. Well, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. But we'll move on to the Jesse Smollett thing. So. <laughs> Uh, Jesse Smollett. Don't worry, Greg. We'll have reason to get you and Randy back. I know. I just feel like I never get the last word on these topics. (laughs) Randy's so good at like kind of pivoting. I feel like I never get to rebut. Um, but we'll, we'll move on, but I would just like to, to lodge us moving on under protest. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Okay. Noted. So Jesse Smollett, um, he allegedly, uh, was walking home on the coldest night in Chicago, on record, or at least on record in a long time, and alleged to have been attacked by two MAGA hat wearing um, and anti and homophobic uh, young men. Uh, the attack happened within a minute as he was in between two security cameras. I think he, he said they were white too, right? Or I he think they were white. so. He said yeah, that yeah, he yeah. saw white skin or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then he emerged in, back into security camera footage with a noose around his neck. Uh, he went up to his apartment, still clutching the subway bag that he was able to hold on to throughout the attack. And apparently uh, still with a noose around his neck. Like still with a noose yeah. around his neck, yeah. Uh, and then like an hour later called the police, uh, gave more details about the attack, like there was bleach. Uh, it it was d- d- disseminated in the media, more or less, as he told it, and then as things started to proceed, it uh, holes began emerging in the story. His story began to change a little bit, and then... And basically, yada, 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 uh, the police <laughs> commissioner came out and uh, alleged that uh, and and had you know evidence to back it up that Jesse Smollett had uh, per- perpetuated a hate crime hoax. They found video footage of his two friends, or at least a friend and a friend of a friend. There were two Nigerian actors yes. who followed Smollett on uh, Instagram and who he had documented interactions with, including cell phone text messages and so forth. Yep, and and checks. And, and checks. Literally, he wrote yep. them a check. Checks, yeah, <laughs> yeah. checks written out that these two individuals uh, uh, conf- apparently confessed to law enforcement uh, th- that, uh, that apparently, I guess, this was payment made for services rendered in terms of facilitating this this fake uh, yeah. this fake this allegedly fake fake attack. Um, and you know, it seems like uh, we are obligated, I think, to use the term term alleged because uh jesse smollett was never uh convicted of any so so the update to this the update to this uh incident is that first it's, it's worth making this note and that is the fact that when the story initially broke and uh jesse smollett we should also say he is famous for being the uh being an actor on a very popular show called empire empire with a lot of great actors including terrence howard and taraji p hansen and so forth um but um when this story initially broke um, this was something that sort of slipped right into the 
to a contentious racial and political conversation in this country because this was a popular young African American uh, a, a gay man who who the story was was attacked and I guess attempted to be lynched uh, by a, or, or uh, well attacked and nearly lynched by two. Trump supporters, two presumably white Trump supporters. Um, and uh, this was something that uh, Democratic presidential candidates uh, uh, believed and pointedly emphasized. Uh, Kamala Harris described it as a, a modern day modern lynching, lynching yeah. or an attempted modern day lynching. Uh, Cory Booker was very quick uh, to say that he believed Jesse Smollett and that this is something that needed to be thoroughly investigated. Uh, Joe Biden, I think, uh, uh, commented uh, in, in support of Smollett, just sort of across the spectrum. And as the story came under more and more scrutiny, uh, people who initially sort of you know were supportive of Smollett's claim wound up walking back the story, and ultimately he was indicted on 16 felony counts for having – basically made these things up. But what wound up, what has now happened is that the charges have been dropped against uh, Jesse Smollett. And the way that sort of weaves into this larger conversation about, you know, polarization and, you know, the the things that we're talking about with respect to the Mueller report and so forth is that on the one hand, this is how I connect these things. On the one hand, I think that uh, you've got folks across America who see, particularly on the left-leaning side, who see the fact that we, although I guess now we're getting the full Mueller report, right? But it seemed as if the only information that upon which we were exonerating President Trump within the Mueller report was a representation of the Mueller report given by an actual Trump appointee as to what was in in the document, and therefore people get the sense that, you know, People on the left get the sense that the Republicans are rigging the game in some sense in terms of being able to protect this president from accountability for things he may have done wrong. But in this interesting case uh, in Chicago, although you've got prominent Democrats like Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel who are decrying this, but the reason the charges were dropped against Jesse Smollett, even though it seemed overwhelmingly obvious to most observers that he was guilty here, is because a recommendation apparently was made by the uh, state attorney uh, for the for Cook County in Illinois, a state attorney named Kim Fox, who apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but she was Michelle Obama's uh, chief of staff prior to being uh, state attorney for yeah. Cook County. And She's connected in Chicago politics and with the Obamas, yeah. Right. She did recuse herself from Well, the but that's the interesting thing. She said that she recused herself initially, but then d revealed after the charges were dropped against uh, Jesse Smollett that she had only recused herself, quote, colloquially and not formally. In other words, she said she was recusing herself but she didn't literally recuse herself. She was, I guess, making the point that she was just more sort of informally distancing herself from this matter. But she still made a recommendation to her to the deputy uh, attorney that uh, after having done – after just Jesse had committed 12 hours of – I think 12 or 16 hours of community service underneath the Rainbow Coalition, which is Jesse Jackson's group, and after having forfeited a $10,000 bond, she made the recommendation that the charges against Smollett be dropped on the basis of his record as a previously having been a non-offender and on the basis of his record of service to the community uh, in the past. And so you have folks on the left too, and including Rahm Emanuel and the Chicago uh, uh, David police, Axelrod, I believe. police chief, and yeah, David Axelrod too. You have people on the left, but certainly on the right who are livid about this because it's not just that uh, the uh, the attorney state attorney uh, Fox is herself you know connected to the Obamas but Jesse Smollett himself you can go online and see uh, footage of him dancing with Michelle Obama at the Kids Choice Awards uh, he is he has connections with the Obama family and obviously Chicago you know is is uh, you know is Obama's uh, uh, political uh, political uh, home uh, essentially and so you know um, it, it fits into this larger phenomenon, I think, of, you know, we look at these things happening and it's like, you know, Democrats have a reason not to trust Republicans when they're in power and, and Republicans have reasons not to trust Democrats when they're in power. And this is sort of a localized thing that happens in the context of this larger sort of sense that people on both sides seem to have that 
You know, once you once you you give these people uh, the reins, uh, they'll do whatever it takes to protect their own people, even at the expense of justice being done, and even if it winds up resulting in the the demonization of innocent folks on our side and so forth. And so President Trump, I think, has tweeted out and pledged that the FBI uh, will be looking into the Smollett matter. And, and so, the DOJ. Spe- and the DOJ. And so speaking of new investigations, we've got some new stuff uh, coming down the pipe uh, in that area as well. Any thoughts, Randy? Well, I, I would say that, you know, initially when I you know read about the story before um, his story had been debunked, uh, basically – you know, I, I felt like I had no reason to doubt him uh, and uh, I, I didn't really, you know, I wasn't paying very close attention to it. But, um, you know, the, there was I kind of pride myself sometimes on uh, on having a BS detector. Right. And, and so when people were were uh, um, posting about Momo, I don't know if you guys were, were keeping up with this uh, recently, but there, there was this Internet scare about this uh, character that would pop up on kids' YouTube videos, and parents all over Facebook were freaking out. And I said, hold on, guys. This doesn't sound right. And I did some research into it. And, <laughs> Momo. you know, Momo, it's it's a weird story. It's it's interesting. I, I think I missed Momo. Yeah, it was it was a weird internet scare that, that is, is kind of strange. But it was... And, and don't Google it because the picture is just very scary. disturbing. Just yes. don't Google it. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And, and so, so I do, and, and even in, in terms of partisan in politics, you know, there's there's plenty of stuff that comes out uh, from strident uh, left wingers who I, you know, think to myself, this doesn't really sound right. And mm-hmm. so I do more research about it and I say, and I'll often find myself on Facebook saying, guys, you know, it, when we spread this kind of misinformation, mm-hmm. this really hurts us, hurts our, our side. Right. So I guess I, I don't really... Uh, remember quite what my reaction to uh, to yeah. the Smollett news was in the very beginning, um, and and I I do wonder if you know my relative you know so I'm I'm a New York Times reader that's uh, mm-hmm. that is the um, the probably bulk of my my news diet um, I try to read the week. Uh, which gives me both sides of the issue, but you know it, it doesn't necessarily encapsulate everything. So I haven't heard uh, uh, some of the things that you're saying mm-hmm. um, about you know the connections with uh, you know with, with the um, with Ob- the Obama administration right. and things yeah. like that. Um, so it does make me think about you know is do I need to expand my news diet mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, my reading about this was through the New York Times, and I, I largely trust them. Mm-hmm. Um, and but uh, while I think their reporting is thorough and and um, and even handed, uh, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily uh, rely on the fact that they have every single aspect of it covered. Mm-hmm. Um, so there might be things that I have a blind spot to. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have. Uh, a, oh, Luke, go ahead. No. Oh, yeah. Um, it's um, well. On the one hand, of course, there's a lot that that can seem a little bit um, seem a little bit uh, funny about just the sequence of events as they emerge, and yet it's another thing that I think dramatically undercuts people's faith in the system, quote, and in each other. And what what I what I would like us to get to a point uh, at as a country is a point to where. We can manage to sort of calmly look at these scandals as they as they take place, and on the one hand, try and give folks on the other side the benefit of the doubt in terms of thinking that they really do genuinely believe what they believe on the basis of the fact that they have a different way of looking at things, which may not line up with our experiences, but that we have to understand if we're going to communicate with each other effectively uh, about with respect to, and on the other hand. That we be able to sort of, you know, because one, I, I get the sense that there are people, and Anth- a- a- actor Anthony Anderson is a bit of an example of this. You guys know Anthony Anderson; he was an actor on a show called Blackish. He's 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 well known uh, since before that show, and uh, you know he's he's, he's Kangaroo pretty- Jack. Being one of the high points. <laughs> he, he was a Nickelodeon star, right? Uh, uh, back in the day. Back in the day, he he yeah. may have been. I mean, he was. So. He's been a lot of stuff. He was in The Departed. I just watched that. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. He came to a bad end in that movie. Um, I did everyone. <laughs> right, but um, what Anthony Anderson? He's political. He's an actor and so forth. And uh, he said that he's he's hosting uh, what award show is coming up? 
that oh, Anthony, pff, Anthony know. Anderson is. Like, yeah. God, we, God, we are. You're an actor, Greg. There's no excuse for that. <laughs> I know, but I don't follow the ins and outs of that. He's stuff. hosting. Anthony's hosting a big award show coming up. Uh, the Image Award. The NAACP okay. Image Awards, I think. Oh. And somebody has nominated Jesse Smollett for an Image Award. <laughs> and Anthony Anderson said, now, it's not even it's not clear to me that Smollett's even going to be invited, but somebody nominated him for one, even though the consensus at this point is that he, he lied in a very sort of heinous way. And again, maybe somehow or other, allegedly, what, and, maybe somehow or other, well, everybody's you, wrong about this. Do you have a but, sense that the nomination uh, happened before the incident? No, no, no. It happened after. Really? Oh, yeah, okay. This wow. is a recent thing. And Anthony Anderson has said that he hopes that he comes and he hopes that he wins. And <laughs> And Anthony's reasoning for this is that, you know, this is a country whose criminal justice system frequently treats people of color grossly unfairly. And therefore, uh, he's okay with evening it out a little bit by allowing for, you know, Jesse Smollett to, you know, to get off and to even be celebrated, I guess, subsequently. Now, um, it's the OJ Simpson, it is like, it is like the OJ Simpson thing. And so look, as a, as a black man myself, uh, I gotta say that and not just as a black man but as a you know as an african american man biracial african american man but one who is acquainted with inner city life and who's you know sort of seen the fraught relationship between the community and law enforcement a person who's you know uh, i think understanding of the you know the frustration that is in the history of the black experience dealing with the criminal justice system i get the fact that you know uh, the history of injustice causes some some folks on the left and certainly within the black community to feel a certain tolerance for, you know, for injustice that actually happens to play out in, quote, our favor. And I think that for a lot of Trump supporters, and I don't say this to suggest that Trump is guilty of anything, but I have talked to Trump supporters. I know Trump supporters who feel that uh, I- even if Trump is guilty of one thing or another, even if he's done all sorts of things that are bad or, you know, that should be criticized, that the guilt of the left is so extraordinary that, you know, uh, it is incumbent upon us to overlook anything that Trump may have done in order for us to defeat a larger evil. And so it gets back to this mindset of, you know, what is the lesser of two evils and, you know, uh, let us justify ourselves in tolerating things within ourselves, within our political teams and within ourselves as individuals maybe that we know uh, are probably wrong but that we need to we need to accept and tolerate in order for us to defeat our fellow Americans who we have vilified on the basis of their perceived guilt. And that's it's the political thing. Political Machiavellianism. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. Although I think Luke has probably have a thought or two about the Machiavellian <laughs> yeah, he, reference. I, I, that he is. I also have a few thoughts <laughs> but, that but, I'd like to get to at some point. Yeah, you know, Greg, you're next. I'm just saying that that's, that, that, that's the thing yeah. that I want to get us get us out of is do what Michelle Obama is, is uh, uh, advocated we do. And that's, you know, when they go home, when they go low, we go high. I think that wisdom should apply to both sides, but it's so hard for people to be reflective. Oh, Eric that Holder way. rewrote that, didn't you hear? Yes. He so did. I, I have uh, just three quick points, and then Greg will get to you. But three, yeah. quick, three quick points from Luke Phillips is going to take us to the end of the episode. So you might, <laughs> want, you might want to make it quick for Greg. I, I, I will, I make, I will make at least the first two very quick. So num- number one, um, I hadn't heard of <laughs> Jesse Smollett before. Um, I don't follow celebrity gossip very much, so. but uh, after this news started coming out, now I know exactly who Jesse Smollett is <laughs> and, and tell you some, some details on him, right? So, mm-hmm. like, uh, at, at that level, at least, like, this helped me educate myself about our celebrity culture, right? Uh, number two... Um, <laughs> Luke does not follow the pop stuff. <laughs> uh, there were some people who commented after the Hamilton musical came out, like, whoa, isn't it so great that in America we can have... Uh, have, uh, have African-American actors cast as racist white men, right? <laughs> and, and I suppose, like, th- this incident here was uh, just kind of like what took it to its natural conclusion, you know? So, um, but, but, but lastly, and more seriously, um, this whole story broke into its peak right about three or four weeks, I think, after the peak of the, um, the Covington Catholic High School uh, media circus that had happened in Washington, D.C., uh, where a couple uh, viral photos and viral videos yeah. uh, of an interaction between some MAGA hat wearing uh, white high school kids and an elderly Native American protester uh, man um, went and polarized reactions all over the place. And mm. one of the things that ended up with that was the family of the 
uh, the families of some of the young kids who were involved and, uh, in their opinion, needlessly trashed on social media. Um, the families of some of those kids went into a major lawsuit against, I believe, the Washington Post and some other media agencies, not in terms of like a recrimination for the things that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've experienced, but more like a, uh, hey, don't do this to, to people anymore. Don't do this to people like us anymore. This was misinformation being gleefully peddled the whole way through. Mm. Don't do it. Right. And it's, it's interesting because I feel like the, there was a big uh, circus over the Jesse Smollett mm. odyssey, but it was comparatively a lot tamer than what had happened just a month before mm. with the Covington kids. Interesting. Thing. Um, and it, it, I feel, I, I don't, I don't know that there was a like general national atmosphere of caution or anything like that after the, uh, the big national scandal that everybody rushed to conclusions in with the Covington thing. But I don't think it would be an unreasonable conclusion to draw that, you know, maybe in this aftermath of a national media humiliation, some of the outlets and a lot of the reporters are taking things with more grains of salt and less likely to, jump to the conclusions that they might otherwise do so. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, my take on the, uh, on, on the, uh, uh, the Covington story, I published in a long essay at better angels media about a, an incident in my murky high school past where I, a young uh, swashbuckling Luke Phillips tried to uh, <laughs> uh, get into an incident that would go viral uh, with some liberal protesters back during the Occupy Wall Street days, right? Mm. And uh, and it was dumb. It was uh, not a very mature thing to do. I'm glad it didn't turn out that way. Um, but I guess at some fundamental level, I can understand um, the, the logic of people, uh, in this case, like Jesse Smollett, who tried to make a media incident go viral right? allegedly yes <laughs> and and there are a lot of them on the left but there are also a lot of them on the right um like uh like everybody's seen all these like uh blank conservative activist owns this protester who almost punched him right stuff like that right. yeah and uh and it's there there's this kind of notion that if you align yourself with a particular moral view and you act on it against strangers in public and humiliate them online then you are fighting for the cause and advancing this kind of virtuous morality in politics. Right. Mm. And um, I think that that kind of, I mean, again, I can understand that attitude because in a more polarizing version of myself, seven or eight years ago, I was like tempted to admire people like that and tried to do that myself. Mm. Um, but John, I think what you're saying uh, and Randy and Greg to what you guys are saying too, is that uh, while that might be, individually fulfilling perhaps in a small way it also contributes to the broader cause of like okay so i have a cause higher than myself and that cause higher than myself is based on opposition to all these other americans who are just toxic and bad for yeah. society and destroying our country and well we're not at war yet but you know we should really treat them like enemies you know and as opposed uh, to our belief in something positive and constructive right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so so when, when all this jesse smollett stuff came out um Number one, I made a point of not commenting on it or even really following it until a couple days or maybe two weeks after the heyday of it. And then I went and looked at the pieces that it had picked up. But I just think we're in a, in a media environment um, based on technology and then a polarized our environment based on just our political situation where doing this kind of stuff makes a lot of economic sense for people. And it hits a bunch of our like feel chords uh, that make make us feel fuzzy inside about being part of a righteous thing. I mean, I, 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 I'm not dissing people who feel that way. Like, I think there there is a real appeal to it, and mm -hmm. it but just it's, seems but to it's, me but that but as it's long a damning as it's a damning reflection on an aspect of our political and social culture. I totally agree. We got to get Greg yeah. in here because yeah. Greg has yes. got yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Apologies. Say. Yeah. I know. No. 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 It's okay. And I'm really digging the conversation. But this has actually touched on a few things and, and a few points that have been mulling on lately. So so pardon me as I kind of gather a, a head of steam here. Um, one point is that. Like I, I hope you're right about um, the media kind of learning its lesson from Covington because it seems like, like the media, it, it, it's okay to be skeptical. I think we're seeing that with. I, I don't think Trump would be able to do such a victory lap on this whole Mueller investigation if the media had just had not reported so breathlessly mm. on each new development and and tried to suss out all the implications. If they had just kind of taken a step back and waited, mm. but but sometimes the media almost acts as if they're not in charge of the media. 
Like they do this with every <laughs> campaign season where they go, oh man, at some point the narrative is going to totally become about like the personal issues of the candidates and not actual policies. And it's like, you're the media. You can change that. And sometimes they're like, well, you know, sometimes stuff just comes up and we report it and then it's there. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but you don't have to do that. You're the media. So I just hope that, that, that some skepticism can um, you know, win the day because it's okay. It's okay to take a second and 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 see before you report on it. A, a second point. These donuts just keep jumping in my mouth. Man. I know. Yeah. How could we <laughs> possibly? You know. Yeah. Uh, another point I want to make, and, and this will be a little bit of a winding journey, but I think I think I'll come back to what what we're what we're talking about. You said something about we don't trust. I know. I see it. So I'm going to do it as, as quickly as I can. We, we were not trusting Point to the time clock. Right? I, yeah, I see it. I they see charge it. by the minute here. And then we'll <laughs> so but not trusting the other side in power. And, and I think what sometimes gets lost is we, as we jump, as we, our attention keeps getting diverted to the issues of the day and the issues of the day are important. They should be talked about, but I think there are some underlying structural issues that are exacerbating all of the problems we have. Um, uh, and I think people freak out about not being in power anymore and they play such, uh, they, pl they play for keeps because now, uh, winning the presidency has basically become, um, a, a, pa a path to getting what you want. I think we're seeing this with Trump when he declared his national emergency mm. on the border. He didn't get what he, what he wanted through the legislative process, which is how you're supposed to get it. So he turned to executive action. It's what he's doing with Obamacare, um, with recommending that, uh, it, filing support along with the states with this dubious lawsuit. He didn't get what he wanted legislatively when, when Republicans were in charge of the House and Senate. So he's turning to the courts. And I think Obama did the same thing. We said, I'm going to rule by the pen and, and the phone. And he said, oh, I can't possibly uh, legalize the dreamers. Right. Uh, and then I'm not a king and then went ahead and did it. And I, and I think the issue is, is that in general, yes, it is it, a government is much more effective if it is ruled by a king or an emperor. And sometimes that's great. If you get a Diocletian, if you get a Marcus Aurelius or, or, or Constantine. But the problem is and what the founders knew and why they devised the constitu constitutional system the way they did is because they also knew that for every Diocletian, there's a Nero or a Caligula. And so they developed this system with 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 a checking of powers um and and separation of the branches in order to combat that and it's and it's slow and it it, it can be frustrating but what the, the trade-off is is that you don't uh succumb to the whims of a madman um and so i think what has happened though over the last 100 years is that the, the founders thought that the the Congress, which is the superior branch, we talk about co-equal, but I think a point has been made very convincingly. If you listen to the uh, Constitutionally Speaking, I think I mentioned it last time, podcast, it's great. Luke Thompson, Jay Cost, highly recommend it. Don't that advertise the, other podcasts. Sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> After you're done listening to this one. But the, but the, 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 joking, joking. The, the, the legislative branch is the number one branch. It can fire the president if it wants. It can fire judges if it wants. The The president is tasked with executing what the legislative branch wants. It's supposed to set the agenda, and the founders assumed that they would guard their prerogative very, very closely. The problem is, in the last 20, 50 years, the, the, the Congress has seemed to uh, have realized that they actually have more power and influence if they take away if they give away all of their tough decisions to the executive branch and oh. and become talking heads on morning joe or get blue check marks mm. by their name on twitter so now we've made the the presidency much 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 too powerful and that i think exacerbates these problems so what it does is it makes people want to win no matter the cost and i think that's why people shift their positions when things become inconvenient. It's why, you know, uh, Democrats now are the party of free trade because it's in opposition to Trump. And it's why Republicans now are for tariffs. It's because that's what Trump wants and that's what's better for Trump and the party. And so people don't care or executive anymore. orders, perhaps. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's, it's, it's now exacerbating the the i think these structural problems exacerbate the issue more than any real issue of the day it's the underlying problem that our government is not now working 
the way it is supposed to work. And I think I, I know I'm kind of arguing for like a conservative solution to to like liberal problems, but I do think if we all became a little bit more conservative in the sense that we 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 demand that the government work in the way that it's supposed to work, some of these issues and some of these playing for keeps would actually die down a little bit. But you are saying something that goes beyond liberalism or conservatism. Luke, who was it who said that the constitution was fit for the governance of only for the governance of a righteous or, or moral people? And holy ins- who? A, uh, a moral and religious people, I think, was the exact quote, and that was John Adams, I believe. Okay, gotcha. And some folks might take uh, exception to the to the reference yes. to religious, but ultimately, I think the wisdom of the statement is that uh, the success of our civic system rests upon the the moral integrity of us, of of American citizens, the American people, and I think that the 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 big demonstration of that moral integrity is the sort of uh, what better angels we might call the patriotic empathy with which we interact with one another. The degree to which we see our responsibility as lovers of this country as residing in our commitment to understanding uh, and respecting our fellow Americans, even across the lines of disagreement and, uh, and, and immediate political interests. And I think that gets to your point about the executive branch and the Congress, Greg, because ultimately I mean, everybody hates Congress, <laughs> but Congress is a reflection of the American people. I mean, we elect our members of Congress and so forth. Obviously, we elect presidents and so forth, too. But if we want to see a Congress that is actually collaborative and that is actually, you know, open, open minded and in as much as they work together in good faith to serve the larger interests of the country and not narrow factional uh, uh, agendas, um, then we as an American people – Need to need to embody those kinds of values and how it is we interact with and treat each other. And so those are my final thoughts for the episode. We are at the hour mark. Everybody here has a whole lot more to say, and you'll get your chance to say it, uh, Greg, Luke, and Randy. Uh, next time we have you all on. So uh, one more time, thank you every much, uh, very much for everybody who's listening. Better Angels National Convention, uh, St. Louis, uh, Washington University, June 20th to 23rd. Go to our website for more information. You see a link in the description below. Like, share, and uh, like and share this podcast. Subscribe. Let's go out and depolarize America. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Happy baseball season, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>